Hello, I'm Miranda. About a week ago, I got to go to a small convention out of Amarillo called AMA Con. It's a neat pop culture convention that I try to go to every year. Very nice people, very fun stuff. This year at AMA Con, Patrick Rothfuss was actually there. Now, I'm a big fan of the King Killer Chronicles, and he was actually part of a panel that I was able to record. Uh, the panel is called Who Knows What Lurks in the Hearts of Men? Moral Choices and Character Development. The panel features, of course, Patrick Rothfuss, Rachel Kane, and A.G. Howard, all authors, as they talk about character development, which I found pretty interesting. Um, so I recorded it for you guys, just fair warning, this was a live panel, so there is a little bit of language in it, uh, just to be aware of, but if you like the video, definitely give it a like. It means a lot to me, I appreciate it. I enjoyed the panel, and I hope you do too. I, I will say I prefer Lynn's self-appointed title. In one of the first meetings, he says, "I want to be I want to be president of the Don't Fuck It Up Committee." <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, oh, I, could, I could instantly felt like my blood pressure dropped by 50 points, and I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I needed that committee. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to be president of it. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start us off with a question. I'm going to let each panelist address the question, and then I will open it up um, to you guys, to the floor. Yes? And I will be roving with the microphone, so yes, you get to do your whole like talk show, rock star little thing with the mic. It's kind of awesome. I love the sound of my voice coming out of a microphone. All right. Um, so last night, my nine-year-old and I were discussing Star Wars, and he asked me why Darth Vader is evil. And I said, well, he didn't start off that way. Um, he started off as a Jedi, like Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan is my son's favorite. He was like, oh, well, what happened? Why did, he, why did he turn evil? And I said, well, it's complicated. Um, it would take several movies to get through it. And he said, you know, I bet he was tricked. I bet he was manipulated by somebody, wasn't it? And I said, well, yeah, he kind of was manipulated by somebody. And Jay said, hmm, that's a very common theme in literature. <laughs> <laughs> I said, indeed it is. Indeed it is. So, panelists, let's talk about corruption. Yes? Let's talk about characters that are corrupted by, right? the evil forces, if you will, as opposed to those who simply originate in evil and stay that way. How do you deal with these kinds of things as you're creating? How do they influence your ideas of evil, etc.? Take it away. Ladies first. AG, you want to start us? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, first of all, I think you should have brought Jeremy. Wait, is I don't know if he's here. He's no, here. of course he's not here. Oh. I'm his mother. Why would he be here? He's playing Halo. He Go ahead. Sound, he sounds brilliant. Um, okay, so you're asking how we deal with people who are corrupted by other things as opposed to they originate in sin, basically? Exactly. And how you deal with creating evil? Um, well, for me, the most... Uh, the kernel of truth in a character, especially in an evil character, is their motivation, what motivates them. Which is basically what you're talking about. I've written a character before, his name is Morpheus, and he's in this one. And he's, he's motivated by, and most of them are, something that they think is true and real. And to them, it's pure for whatever reason, this motivation is justifiable. And um, I've also written a character which is I like re retelling of Phantom of the Opera, and so that character is Eric, and Eric was actually corrupted by his environment, by the way people treat him. You know, he has a vengeance because of that. And so the, the difference between those two characters and writing them was really fascinating because one of them completely works on his own, outside of everybody else, he doesn't care. He knows what he needs to do to get things done, and he does it. Eric is motivated by, he's wounded, and there's a part of him that's very soft still, but there's that part of him that's pure anger and evil, and 
So they are motivated, they're each motivated by things they believe in, but one of them is more motivated by his wounds, whereas the other one is more motivated by power, and this is what has to be done for this to happen, what I want to happen. I don't even know if I answered it, but that's, that's sort of my take on those two different kinds of characters from my two different books here. <laughs> Rachel, you're up. Oh, darn. Okay. <laughs> uh, I tend to... I tend to look at evil as a as a process. Um, yeah, there are there are certainly some people who I think maybe you know just start out that way. But I find it much more interesting to talk about evil in terms of the compromises that lead you there, uh, because a lot of it boils down to greater and greater degrees of selfishness and. Uh, the reason I like writing vampires, uh, and I, I still love writing vampires, is, is that essentially they are selfish. They're creatures that have decided they're more valuable than you are. And, and I, I find that mindset really interesting because in their own mind, they may have really good reasons for it, but that doesn't mean it is needed. And uh, I, I find that complexity really compelling. Um, I, I did a, <laughs> we were talking about retellings, I, I did a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, and uh, I got to turn Mercutio a little bit evil, because, because, not because he wanted to be, but because circumstances continue to force him into a smaller and smaller box. And uh, I, I, I'm reading a book now called, uh, by Jeff Summers called uh, We Are Not Good People. And it sort of starts out with this uh, idea of blood magic. And a little bit of blood can give you a little bit of magic. A lot of blood can give you a lot of magic. You can use yours, or you can use somebody else's. And so the whole train of thought that goes into that, this we are not good people, runs under all of it. And I found that to be really resonating with me because it, it just talked to that theme so, so wonderfully. Is it what makes people evil? Can you give it, can you give it just the, the raw question? Sure. Um, are people born evil? Or are they corrupted into evil? Or some of both? Um, I don't believe in evil, ultimately. Um, which is a shame because it's a really useful narrative convention. Um, and I want to bet that I don't use the word in my books at all. Um, you know, for, like in The Lord of the Rings, I'm pretty sure um, there was there was a lot of evil talk in there. And so I got that at an early age, and certainly I played a bunch of D&D, &D, you know, and like, and there, like part of your character creation process is, are you lawful, neutral, or chaotic? Are you good, or neutral, or evil, and everything in the world theoretically bits into that grid, and and then there's also the, uh, there's a spell, like detect evil, you know, which from a gameplay viewpoint is super useful. You know, it's like, walk, and I'm like, oh, it's the eight of them, right? <laughs> and, uh, you've got the evil one, just take them back. Um, and, but like, once you, do more than just kind of scratch the surface of that thought. Now, Tolkien actually does a pretty good job with it because there, the evil is kind of like legitimately baked in. Like the orcs are are like corrupted version. You go way down into the mythos. The the orcs are corrupted elves that were like captured and and turned into something bad. And so it's at least a cohesive mythology. But in terms of, like, in all practical senses, in all practical situations, if about characters or people that you meet or talk to, I don't, I don't believe in evil. I think that people can be selfish and are selfish. I think that people can be inconsiderate. Um, and I think that people can be rude. And those are, they touch each other, but they don't, none of them overlap perfectly. 
Um, it touches a little bit on what I was talking about before in terms of empathy. The more empathy you have, the less likely you are to be selfish or rude or inconsiderate, which is why it's sort of this gold star characteristic you can develop. It. But people can be selfish, and I think you can be trained to be selfish. I think you can be programmed to be selfish. And actually one of the most terrifying things that I've become aware of is how some things internally um, we have no, not much choice over. Like some of our biological responses to things. Um, there's a lot of good studies that have shown, I mean there's weird stuff that we're only finding out about, like depending on what your mother or your grandmother's nutritional habits were, it impacts like your genetics. And so I am maybe more likely to get fat because grandma was super hungry. You know, and it's like that's a vast simplification. But if you look at this biologically, hugely advantageous. It's like, you know, drought, famine, drought, famine. And then you have a baby, it's like, well, let's have this baby, pack on some pound, going to have a hard life in this environment. And it's like, well, unfortunately, I live in Wisconsin, you know? <laughs> Land of cheese and so on, facts, you know? And, and I do not have to worry about living, growing up on a farmstead or something like that. And that actually, you know, that biological imperative actually makes good sense because you know, it could be that to survive, if you went back 10,000 years, what your child needs to learn is to be scared, stay home, do not share, take care of the family group, take care of the tribe. Why? Well, because, you know, the other people will kill you and take your shit and then you'll starve. And maybe that works. Maybe that is biologically, evolutionarily advantageous. But here's the problem. Uh, they actually discovered that in the first year of a child's development, uh, what they need more than anything, parents or parents to be, please take note, what a child needs in that first year is love and affection and to have all of their desires satisfied. You cannot spoil a child before the age of one. It needs comfort, love, and it to be attended, and if it cries, it means it needs you. And so you give it comfort, attention, food, warmth. They have very few desires and they need to be met. And if this happens, your child, it's, it's wiring gets set to, I am living in an environment that is full of resources, which are readily available to me. If it doesn't learn that, it learns Instead, that it will be existing in a scarcity economy. And in a scarcity economy, it is to your advantage to be a little bit of an asshole. Now, take into account the fact that our country disadvantages the poor, does not give them resources, you know, to run the families and luxury. And the fact that we have one of the most regressive, like, parental policies in the civilized world. We do not give mothers and fathers ample time to just spend time with their children when they're born. That means a vast majority of children grow up biologically believing that they are in a scarcity economy. And that means that their impulse, something inside them, will say to them for their whole lives, you better make sure you have enough. And that's a seed of deep selfishness you cannot blame them for. That was done to them and not by their parents because their parents are maybe working two jobs. Who did that to them? Who did that to them? Kind of. We all did that to them. That was us. Because we have not done a good enough job building a society that takes care of people who need emotional, 
and financial support and the children that exist in those situations. So congratulations. Congratulations. You know? Um, <laughs> now, maybe some of you have voted in certain ways or picketed or protested or, you know, tried to help. But, like, you got to cop to it. You are part of the system. And if you're not pushing for children getting what they need, then you are sowing the seeds of the inevitable wave of assholes that will arise from that. <laughs> it is dragon teeth. And they're going to be taking care of you. <laughs> no, they won't. Well, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, I mean, I, I come from this angle lately because I'm really, I'm really kid-centered right now, you know? Um, and I've got these two little boys in my life, and I think a lot about, like, what am I doing to them intentionally and unintentionally? Uh, can you come back from that? Yes. You can be a good person despite the program. You can get better. You can get educated. You can learn about this. But boy, it's way easier to start off, you know, with a little bit of an advantage than to, like, fight uphill your whole life. And, and I mean, in closing, let me say, there's a, a journalist called Penny Red. It's, I don't think it's her real name. What's her real name? Um, she writes for The Guardian. She's a great progressive journalist. She wrote along with, um, I can't remember his name. There was all the protests at Berkeley when he went to speak. Milo, oh, yeah. yeah, the second fix, whatever his name was. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a bad person. He's a legitimate bad person. Um, and he cultivates badness in others. And she wrote along with him and his crew. And she's listening to, like, she refers to these as boys. They're these boys, and like, they're unsure of what they're doing. Obviously, they have that home life. Obviously, they're not mean people. They're not looking to foster a culture which leads to violence against folk, those who are different. But they are doing that. And she said in there, she wrote one of the best sentences I have ever read in my life. It's a sentence so good that if you write it, if you write a sentence that good, the rest of your life is gravy. She wrote, hurt people hurt people. And I went, I will never write a sentence that good, that true. And it is a shame that people end up in situations where the only way they can interact with the world is through hurting them. But that doesn't give you a pass. And it doesn't make an excuse for you to not be better than that. We could all of us be better than we are. And the shame of the matter is, is that hurt people hurt people. And that puts everyone in a bad situation. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up, but I will let you guys follow up. Um, questions? Anybody? Yes. All right, so I hate hearing the sound of my own voice. <laughs> uh, I don't see how you'll do it. Okay, so this goes a little bit back to the keynote. Pat said that you know we develop empathy through reading. And we all can think of the positive benefits of that. We learn how to have relationships with others. We gain other perspectives. One of the things to point out is we also get the bad stuff. So sort of there is a moral responsibility to the writer, a little bit of that. You could unintentionally cause harm with what you've written. That being said, is there a moral good that can come about for writing about immoral people who do immoral things. Like that is your protagonist, an immoral character who does immoral things. Is that just harmful to society because we take that in? Or does it have a good component? That's a super good question. Anybody out there have an answer for it? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you're on the hook. That really is a good question because the, the problem for me is I don't think there's a right answer or a wrong answer because it, 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 if you're if you're talking to a, a, an audience of people who can see it for what it is, there's a good outcome. But if you look at if you get an audience of people who see that as a goal, you get a completely different outcome. It's that is very that's very uh, receptor based. 
in a, in a very direct sense. But you know, most fiction is. We don't, we don't know what the impact is going to be of what we put down. Uh, we only know it after the fact, and sometimes we regret it. Because you can't do this, I think you can't do this kind of job without taking risks of some kind. And sometimes those risks aren't good. I, I think so. My early works, I look back on them and I cringe and I think I wish I had never written that scene or written that way. But it's too late and it's done and I'm not going to go buy up all the copies. But if you find them, let me know. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I think there is a real responsibility. But it can also paralyze you as, as a writer. Uh, you really have to think about the most good you can do and the least harm you can do. You're always going to do some harm somewhere. Um, uh, I, I think about this a lot because I'm obviously not writing a utopia in my world. There are bad, there are people who behave in bad ways and the cultures that exist are flawed because to do it otherwise, it doesn't really ring true. Um, utopias feel very fake to us. Um, and so like, for example, I remember showing, uh, one of the things, I, one of the ways I avoid the, the uninten unintended consequence where you accidentally you, you do some harm is I have a ton of beta readers um, who are smarter than I am and very different than I am in many areas. And I remember showing it, to, uh, showing the first book to, I think it might have been Nedia Korifor, which, like, if you don't read her books, you really ought to. Um, uh, she's the one, uh, HBO just picked up her series uh, with Martin producing. Yes. Um, and, you know, she read that, and at some point, uh, they say, oh, well, they don't whip women at the university in terms of punishment. They only do that for guys, and she's and she writes in the margin. She's like, and then she on the phone. She's like, this is kind of bullshit. Women actually have a much better like pain tolerance than men. And da, 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 da. And she goes, this is really like, oh yeah, it's sexist as hell at the university. Um, and so like I deliberately built, deliberately with intention, built sexism into this culture. Um. But I try to make it clear that it's it's kind of some bullshit uh, because and the, the the women living in this in this culture resent it and they do not deserve this treatment. You know, Debbie was kicked out of the university because she was a woman. You know, and did not decide to like play polite with everyone else. Um, and so there, I think you can show things that aren't good and still be responsible. Um, and, and not worry too much about, you know, now again, some people might read that as justification for their own, like, bad agendas, their own bad thought patterns. You know, and do no harm, you're right, will paralyze you. Like, be, be super careful, is, is, the, is the game I play. Now that said, there was a really great article. We've got this HBO series coming up called The Confederacy. There was a really great article just written um, about that. And somebody said, here's why we don't need to give this a chance. And it's like, imagine a future world where slavery never ended. And everyone's like, no, we do not need this in our culture. Um, and similarly, I think you could write um, you know, there's a lot of people who have been poisoned in their lives and believe a lot of very dangerous and awful things about race and who might be goaded to action through seeing a world in which this is legitimized. And if you have a bunch of slave owners in this show and they are made sympathetic, which again, for good characters, you want them to be sympathetic. And so suddenly you're going to have, and you're like, oh, sure, he owns slaves, but oh, but he's not really a bad guy. We don't need that. We don't need to learn. We do not need a generation of people on TV watching TV and internalizing the lesson that you can be a racist slaver and still a good person. That is not, it's like, 
No. We can just say, uh, well, what are the potential benefits we can get? No. Uh, and similarly, you could write a book that you know painted this villain rise to power all of these awful things. You could write this great anti-hero and maybe have it really not be the worst of the potential damage that it would do to a leadership. It's a weird thing to think, but I think a book can be deleterious to a person that reads it or to an entire population. Um, what they said. <laughs> <laughs> now I know why I went first last time. Um, what I agree with both of you, basically, really, you can't just forget the past, and you can't forget everything that happened. And if we're going to write about it in any way, we also need to have the responsibility enough and the respect enough to show the bad side of it, why it's bad, show the ripple effects and how it will affect an entire society. And, and how it can like affect our children down the line. And I think as long as we um, are responsible in, in writing it and show you the bad side of it, I just, like you said, you can't make this horrible, villainous person so sympathetic that people are like, okay to do that because he's still a good guy. You know, it doesn't change that he's a good guy. You have to show how it affects all these people that he's doing it to in order for a reader to actually be able to justify you writing about that. That's how I feel. You know, and just, and just a, one other little piece that's a little less extreme than this, but I think it illustrates the point. At one point in the first book, I needed young folk to have a heroic moment. And so there's the fire in the fishery, for those of you that read Red Neighbor Red. And I wrote it, and I, I, I got it to work pretty well. I liked, I liked the way that it was working. And he got to be dynamic, and he was clever, and he was heroic. And he rushes in, and he saves Fellow, one of his friends at the university. And then I wrote it, and then I read it, and I went, oh, he has rushed in, he saved the helpless, attractive female. And I go, oh, I did it. I did not mean to do that. But I was kind of following in this groove that literature has carved. And so then I go, OK, I, I've done it. It's not in print yet. I can fix it. And I go, can I change this so that he saves sin? And I, I kind of tried to work it out. And it did not have the same emotional impact. Why? Well, because culturally, it's really satisfying because We've re all read so many stories where the hero saves the helpless young woman. I could not get the emotional impact I needed from Code's arc if he rescued Sim. And, and that was my thing. I could not, I didn't, I'm not writer enough for that at that point in my life. But I acknowledged that what I was doing was reinforcing an unhealthy character, uh, cultural stereotype. And then I rewrote it so that it was obvious that Fella had done everything she could in her situation, and she just got back beat. Like, there was no way for her. She was clever, but no. Clever, but no. And then she was trapped. And then Clove helps his friend. And then later, they even talked about it, and she's like, I, felt, I feel so useless. You know? It's like, you like came in and you saved me. I never thought I would be that woman. And he's like, he's like, no. Like, I, uh, it wasn't that you were useless. It's that you were, you could not help yourself. And so I helped you. And so I tried to ameliorate that thing that I had done. But I also knew I was still doing it. And so I'm like, I have burned up a lot of karma here. And I better earn that chip back somewhere else. <laughs> and that's exactly how I thought it. It's like, I got one. I do not get another one like that. I have to be better than that by writing. Yeah. Excellent. Hello. Um, okay, so I have a question. Um, we talk a lot about morality and writing, hurting people or helping people, and that kind of thing. And so when you're writing, is it more important to you to uh, tell the truth? Or, what you, or to try to tell the truth, or what you consider the truth, or to 
write something that might be helpful or like morally beneficial or good to other people? That's a good, that's a good question too. Yeah, and there's that dilemma again where we can just stall ourselves as writers and not even be able to move forward if we think it through too hard. And um, personally, you have to be true to the story. You have to be true to the characters. I think it was Stephen King that said that. I don't remember. It's in the, about writing. Have you guys heard that? But I, I remember him saying, um, and it's about it's about the um, suspending disbelief for the reader, and they're going to know if you're lying to them. You know, so you do have to be true. Maybe it's, it comes down to the point of does that part even need to be there? I like what you did with your part. You know, and actually have a frank discussion later on with the characters, and maybe you could do something like that. But I, I do think you have to be true because I think readers can see right through it. You guys are smart, and I think you you'll see right through it. If it's if it's too preachy, if it's too if it's not real and authentic to that book, and those characters in that moment. Yeah, I think there's a huge difference between preaching and teaching, and it's like you got an agenda, it will reek of agenda. Whereas if you kind of want to show some useful thoughts or some interesting thoughts, that comes out very different. When it influences you, but we want, don't want you to know we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I totally agree. It's, it's, you have to, whatever the story is you're writing, and I've written some really dark stories. Um, I, I have a thriller out now that's super dark. But the truth of that for me was, I needed to. I needed these people to to come out of it, but I had to make it. I had to make it realistic enough that their struggle made sense. The costs that they were going to have to pay made sense, uh, and I and that that meant I had to go pretty dark with it. But there were many times, you know, I had a lot of people read it and and I'd say, is it too much? Did I did I take it too far? Do I need to pull back? And and sometimes in some scenes I did take it too far. But that's where again this the other eyes need to see it. Because you as the writer are just one person looking at it and the echo chamber in there, you don't really know how other people are gonna see it. And and boy, I can't tell you how many mistakes I've made that beta readers or, or just you know friends reading it have saved me from. Um, because I, it's, you just don't you don't know what you don't know, and there's so much of that. Um, so yeah, I, I think the more we can get people involved in the process, first voice has to be ours, but then you got to listen, and you got to listen a lot. Yeah. Um, somebody uh, when Terry Pratchett passed away, gave and wrote about it. And he said, you know, everyone, you know, he, he writes this humorous fantasy. And towards the end of his career, most everyone acknowledged that he was not just a humorous fantasist. You know, he was one of the, the greatest living storytellers of our age. Um, and, but still, always there was humor in what he wrote. And, and Gaiman, I can't remember how it came about in this interview, but they said, well, how would you describe Terry? And he would say, mostly uh, angry. He was angry a lot. And I don't hear people talking about how angry he was all the time. Because, uh, and it seems like Pratchett, from this description, had uh, a bad case of what I am afflicted with a lot. It's, there's a German word called uh, word called uh, Weltschmerz. It's like I think it translates literally as like world hurt. And I've heard it described as the anger that you feel when the world is not as it should be. And I think Pratchett felt that way all the time. And then he wrote these books where there were problems and there were bad people. And then there were good people, and they got together, and things worked out, and you could be hopeful. And like, and truthfully, as somebody with a mood disorder who like occasionally bottoms out kind of hard, 
I, I'm going to Terry Pratchett, and I read a couple of his books, and, I, and after reading them, I go, I go, okay, people are good. People are good, and the world is good, and things can be okay, and that kind of helps me get me back in the game. Even though, in terms of like raw realism, that's, that's, that's not what I go for in Pratchett. Uh, as opposed to like, and I don't want to seem like I'm throwing stones at kind of a field of fantasy that's risen lately. Uh, like Joe Abercrombie is an amazing writer. And I read that first law trilogy and it knocked me over with his craft and originality. And at the end of it, I kind of wanted to just like lay down and never get off again because I'm like, I'm like, oh, I finished the book, and I'm like, oh, everyone is awful. <laughs> everyone is awful, and the world is awful, and it will keep getting worse because the best person in this book is a torturer, and he himself is a part of the system and knows it and will never fight it. I like great books. Joe, and like, Joe, you're amazing. I don't ever want to read. I don't want to feel that way anymore. Um, I never want to read 1984 again. <laughs> you know, such a good book, so important, so. And I read it, and I'm like, I just, just go lay on the floor and be sad for like a week. <laughs> um, so I think they're both useful for di people in different places. I don't need someone to convince me at this point that there are dark things in the world. I'm in that game, I can see it with my own eyes. I need to practice sometimes to be like, okay, buddy, you go to your corner, let's have some orange slices, let's take a little nap, and then we get back out there because we need, we, need, we need soldiers in the fight. Next question. Hi, my name is Jessica. I'm a freshman at Hey guys, I actually love to hear my own voice, so I'll try to make this quick. Um, I'm a public school teacher. I teach, I teach sixth grade reading, and I teach sixth grade writing for the first time, as well as reading next year. And one thing sixth graders love is really dark things. And I didn't know this until they just kept wanting more dark stories. I mean, we read The Telltale Heart, and he's like, die! And like, they're just, they loved it. Um, so my question to you is, as I'm kind of their gate, Keeper to a lot of things in a lot of ways, and I have a I have a lot of power to show them good books and things, and and I, I want to foster their love for writing like I do for reading and let them explore and find what they like. But I also, you know, that power thing, the empathy, the you know, how dark do I let their writing get? You know, like as as their teacher and guider, what what would be your advice on helping? young writers get uh, to that point where they can be self-expressive but not do the typical public teacher thing and kind of ruin their love for writing and exploring those ideas? First and foremost, I would ask a developmental psychologist because there is probably a developmental stage that is happening around that age that can make them sort of like revel in the exploration of these things that they know are dark. Um, and I am not qualified to speak on that. And my kids haven't reached that, so I don't have any direct experience. But I will share, I think some of that like darkness and that love of that, I don't think it's innate. But again, that's why I want to talk to a developmental I don't think it's innate. I think a lot of it is learned. And I think that uh, there's a lot of violence in media that children are exposed to far before it is healthy for them. You know, I do not let my kids watch a lot of TV. And for those of you future parents, like, you should not let your kids watch TV before the age of two. And I'm sorry if you did that. Don't feel bad. You didn't know. But, I mean, they, they've come up with the, the huge studies say it retards their social and language growth, period. And the more you do it, the more it retards them. Right? So like, why can you feel break a little? Um, and why? Well, because developmentally, they're supposed to be spending their time looking at faces, you know, and learning how to move things with their hands, not like smiling at a TV that does not smile back. That's why it screws them up. 
Um, and again, sorry, it's the science. Um, but similarly, I we used to tell my boys, who again, I really kept them away from watching a little bit of TV, but never violent things. And my little boy would say, tell the story of the big bad wolf. And we would, and they love it, because there's repetition, and there's huff, and I'll puff, and I'll blow the house down. Oh. And then he'd say, can you tell the story of the big nice wolf? Because he wanted this story, but no violence. And this contravenes everything that I was ever taught about storytelling. Because if you remove the bad out of the wolf, technically, you have no tension or conflict. Like, it's not a story anymore, right? Wrong. He loved the story of the big, nice wolf who would go around, blow down the house, and then the pigs would just leave. And go to the next house, he'd blow that one down too, but he could blow down the and great story. He, he, he did not need the violence. We can be taught to need the violence. It's like an iron chef when Bobby Flay comes in, and he's like, put all the spices. And then Iron Chef Japanese comes in and he's like, I have a lot of subtle flavors and the judge is like, no, we can't taste that anymore. I've been ruined, you know, with this goddamn awful American, you know, chef. <laughs> like, you know, effectively raising this, the, the stakes on flavor to the point where you cannot enjoy subtle things anymore. And that might be happening a little bit to your kids, so maybe showing them good but subtle stories um, and if you ever want an example of something that does not need violence or drama or danger, my neighbor Totoro is fucking gripping. It is gripping, and not only is there no villain or violence, there's not even an antagonist in the story. It's brilliant. Watch that a couple of times and figure out how does he make that work, because that's good storytelling. Sorry, I got, I got really long. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that I have anything to add. Um, I, I will say, I will say that one of the things that I've done when, because uh, occasionally I will have writing classes with with younger writers, and uh, I ask them to put themselves in that situation. I, I when they write something that's really over the top, I say, so how would you feel? If you came home and this and this was happening, how would you feel about it? And and it kind of stops them because putting it inside their own head and it not being some cartoonish thing that's happening to someone else kind of makes them pull back a little bit and say, "Well, I wouldn't like it." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, let's explore that a little bit." <laughs> so you know, you can you can do a little bit of that just really quietly. Asking questions to, for, to have them self analyze it. Um, or how would you feel if it was your best friend? Or how would you feel if you know, they Just kind of feel them out a little bit. And sometimes they'll just say, I wouldn't care. I mean, I have, I have one young lady that, you know, wrote a story about murder and her and, and dead, dead people everywhere. And I was like, what if it was your parents? And, and then she was like, <laughs> and I went, and I looked at the teacher, and she was like, yeah, make it out. <laughs> but, but you know, that told you something, right? So. I, I can't follow you guys. Um, I, I think that they nailed it, especially, I think, if you can use it in some way. Here you are. I was looking for you. You can use it in some way to teach them empathy and to teach them to put themselves in this character, because not only are you teaching them how to write, because that's how you write, you put yourself in your character's heads, but also teaches them to think of the world differently and think of things that they might see somewhere that happen to someone in a different perspective, in their perspective. Then that, I think that would be a good, a good way to handle it, the darker stuff. And, and I really do, I, you know, uh, I've started going in and seeing a developmental psychologist in anticipation of the things I'm going to have to deal with for my kids. Not because there's something wrong, but because I want to make sure that I'm not making mistakes or expecting things from them that I shouldn't expect. Um, so I guess I'm kind of obsessive. Um, 
And one of the things, like when kids hit three, one of my little boys would say to Sarah, what if my head got cut off? And, and the, the, the therapist was like, yeah, that's about three. <laughs> they will do things to get a rise out of you. And if, you get, if, they're, if you're like, oh, school, oh, oh, then what they're getting is this tension. But what they're exploring is like, what things freak mom out? <laughs> that's their developmental stage. And so and it's, it's normal and it's healthy. And if you don't want to really feed into it, you just got to learn to like settle yourself down when your kid says something like this. And, but it's normal in the same way. Uh, and it could be that at sixth grade or wherever this was, what they are doing, this bigger exploration, is similarly healthy and good. Um, and so I, I wouldn't worry about tamping it down until I learned that piece of the puzzle. Um, because like you can do damage to kids. Like there's a certain developmental that we all value sharing. But uh, like when a kid is two, they need to learn how to be selfish. It's like now I'm learning about ownership and being able to put like boundaries and protecting things that are important to me. At that stage, you don't want to force your kid to share because the development they're trying to accomplish internally is learning how to how to want and own. And then later you build in how to share, but you gotta hit it in the right moments. So yeah. Yeah, just don't make them read where the red fern grows or old yeller. <laughs> because 48 years old still haven't recovered from either one of those. Thank you very much. Yes. Wow. So I don't know how exactly I'm going to word this, but like going back to kind of like the moral development of a character, like how exactly would you try to like if you're writing a character has an extreme moral dilemma, like what they feel is doing, what they're doing is correct to them, but at the same time it's hurting people that they're trying to help. Like how would you explain writing that? Um, again, I think, like what we were talking about earlier, you're putting yourself in your character's head. And if you can see, and also if you can make the reader see the justification that the character sees, you're going to be able to flesh that character out and make it feel real. They, I mean, but also, again, you have to show how it's hurting people. And maybe this character is blind to that. Maybe they're so blinded by their drive and determination and their selfishness that they can't see what they're doing is hurting other people. They know that this, like Morpheus in my book, he's sort of the um, antagonist. And he is, everything he does is for the greater good of Wonderland. Even if he has to drag all these other people through the mud, you know, no matter if he has to kill somebody, um, he doesn't care as long as at the end result is Wonderland thrives and lives. That's all he cares about. And he doesn't see, he's got blinders on. And I think um, you can do that, and you can craft as a storyteller because you're not only in his head, but you get in the heads of these other characters. You can show from their perspective how it's hurting them and still develop this character and be true to that character and build on that. I think I answered it. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was just realizing I actually have that situation in the book that just came out, um, in the third book of my Great Library series, because I actually have my main character. This is this is harder because this is first person in his viewpoint, uh, having to make some choices because it's the only way things will work. But he can't tell anybody else why he's doing it, and everyone else sees it as a complete betrayal. So it's costing him. And, and, and it's costing him perhaps some friendships that he may not be able to rebuild. But that, that to me was the moral cost of doing the right thing. But he has to feel that. And you have to feel that pain from the other characters in order to really sell it. Um, so I think that the more, you can, the more you can really face the pain of it, the better off you are. Because if it's the right thing to do, even if it's uncomfortable, maybe you just have to do it. And 
bear the consequences. Yeah. <laughs> Ultimately, it's the, that particular question is so general. The, the only like real true answer I can think to it is, boy, it really depends. You know, and that's super useless. Uh, but ultimately, it's, it all will lie in the execution of it. It's not the situation. You say, oh, well, what if he was doing this and then this, but then this might happen. It's like, you can take any scenario and you can write it one way and it will work. You can write it another way and it won't. It's all execution. And so worrying too much about like, oh, what about the shape of it? That's good to a certain extent, but then you gotta get in there and do it. Because until you do it and then say, what do you think about this? And somebody reads it, they cry, that's probably good, you know? If they read it, then they cry, and then they throw off that back. <laughs> uh, there's probably other things going to happen too, just, you know, it's not <laughs> just one of those two. If they throw the book at you, it could be good or bad. <laughs> One more after this one. All right, I guess, um, how do you, when you're researching, how do you prevent yourself from all of a sudden having 18 degrees in developmental psychology and anthropology and economics and cultural anything? Like, where do you draw the line, or how do you know you have information to go forward with an idea? Are you talking about how do you know to stop your research, or how do you know how to weave that in, or to hone it to make it more specific? How to prevent yourself from sounding like a dictionary <laughs> or an encyclopedia, right? Or to going too far down that particular rabbit hole. So you're curious about a cultural aspect about a culture, and then you start learning about that culture, and then that turns into an obsession with something else, and then you're getting completely away from the idea in the first place. When, I, 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 that's a very interesting question. I'm not even really sure how to answer that, but I know that when I'm researching something that, say, my character needs to know or is going to help me build a civilization or, you know, a society or something, I just research however much I think, I feel like I get to the point where I'm like, okay, this is how much my character would know I've done, and I put it aside. So I don't start getting off on all these other little, you know, like you said, follow down the rabbit hole or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I do. I just kind of, and then you've got to move on. You've got to write it. You've got to weave it in. But I just get what my character would know, or my character or my society or whatever. Uh, what I do is, it, well, it, what, what I find interesting about research is sometimes you go into research with one idea and you come out with a completely different one. You know, because there, there, are, there are things that I've discovered in my research that fundamentally changed my entire, not just, not just plot points, but the entire thrust of the book, the entire message of the book, because it was so much more resonant and deeper because of the things that I was finding out than my original rather shallow idea turned out to be. So I think research can really help you in that way. It can also drag you under um, if you get too caught up into it. But I think you'll know at a certain point when you're just doing it to do it because you're no longer really interested in the story you're telling. <laughs> you're more interested in finding out more about the subject rather than how it applies to your story. It can, it, it's, it's a subtle change though. I've gone way overboard. I have 17 college level textbooks about meteorology. And I didn't need to know that much. <laughs> Say, uh, Sam Sykes, uh, who I don't know if you guys run into him on Twitter, one of the funniest people on Twitter, honestly. Uh, he, he, he said, um, he goes, with romance, you know, the rule for romance is also the same as the rule for world building. He goes, it's gone wrong if you can tell at what point in the book the author started to touch himself. <laughs> you know? And it's like, and, 
and the translator, I mean, he said that, and I just died, like, just remembering it here. I just started to laugh, but I'm like, boy, that's really true, because sometimes you're like, like, boy, you're, uh, I know this is a maritime novel, but, uh, you are super into, like, this, the description of the sails, aren't you? <laughs> is this maybe, is this maybe not about the boat anymore? <laughs> is this maybe not in service to the story? Is this, you just have a thing, is this your steez? <laughs> um, but, you know, to, to, to pull it back from that direction, uh, for my hobby, I like building this world. I like exploring this world. I like thinking about things like uh, like the Aiden, you know? I'm like, wouldn't it be interesting if, or what about if, or what if you had an actual matriarchy, you know? How could I portray a genuine sex positive culture to a culture that is not even aware that a sex positive culture can exist? Like, can I communicate that uh, without making it the whole point of this section of the book? You know, that's a hobby. World building is my hobby that fortunately dovetails into my job, which is writing a book. But there's a difference between what I am doing for the book and what I am doing for me. And I think there's there's two different types. I think there's uh, there's soundstage authors who it's like, they're like, you know what, I got some plywood, I got some canvas, I got a perfectly competent guy that works for 15 bucks an hour who can paint something out there that I'm gonna put my characters in front of that, that cardboard cutout, and we're gonna tell a story, and then we're gonna move on. And then there's, there's the beat on the other end of that, where I'm like, if you're walking down this street, I want you to feel like, you know, if you turn left, that's where the story goes, and you're in an alley and whatever. But if you turn right, I want you to feel like you're a different alley, and something is going on there, and like the rivers are in places for a reason, and the economy works, and so does all the sociology, and there's like a thousand years of history and a bunch of false religions that people believe in anyway, and the 13 different currency systems. And that's what you get with the iceberg. You know, like, I make this much world, and then I show you this much world, but Hemingway, what did he say? He goes, something like, the grace with which the iceberg moves is not because of what you see, it's because of what you don't see. I think my world feels cohesive and real because of all these other things you don't see. It's like a deep keel in my book that keeps it from being inconsistent logically. Uh, but again, that's because it's my hobby and because I'm obsessed, and it's not for everyone. Now, you don't write 50 books, by the way. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. Anybody? Right here. Um, if you're writing a, like, a character and like uh, they start out innocent how would you go about maturing them in a way that would seem realistic if at the same time you need for that character I worry about realism first and uniqueness second because I wrote a story about an orphan boy that goes to a school of magic <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know just so you all know, like Harry Potter wasn't the first one to do that either <laughs> there was there was a thousand before Harry Potter, and there will be another thousand. Uh, but the reason my book invites very few Harry Potter comparisons is because the execution is everything, the feel is everything, the world, the consistency. Uh, it, it, you know, there's there's not a lot of Harry Potter versus code talk. Uh, just because it's, it's laughable because it's like, no, the world just doesn't support, their worlds cannot overlap at all, but they both feel realistic in the rules of their own worlds. It feels like that's, that's such a personal journey for the character. There's no right or wrong answer there because, you know, every one of us 
had a moment where we realized the world wasn't necessarily good and everybody wasn't our friend. And that was a moment that kind of shattered that little bubble. But it's different for everybody. I still haven't gotten my Barbie back. <laughs> but. Um, so, you know, my mom tells me the story that I don't remember. We moved to a new house. I went outside. I had a Tonka truck. And apparently it was like this really nice, like, made out of metal Tonka truck. And apparently I came back inside, and I went, Mom, there were kids out there, and they asked if they could see my truck. And I said yes. And then they didn't give it back. I was just baffled, and I didn't realize, even talking about, like, when am I going to get my truck back? And, like, I didn't realize, even telling my mom, that, like, I was never getting that truck back. Um, you know, and actually that, really, that made myself sad with that story, because even though I don't remember it, I will say this, go small. Go small or go home. There's, I'm going to put that on a freaking t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> because one of the things I said in a caffeine frenzy on, on the podcast with Max Schwartz is that, like, why would you try to make a movie out of my books? It's like, all that happens to Clove is, like, he gets his library card revoked. You know, it's like, that's not high drama. That's not an action scene. I go, but the truth is, I will break your heart over that library card. You know, it's like, he get, his shirt gets ruined, and you're like, oh, no. You only have two shirts. <laughs> it sucks, man. It's like, that's not high fantasy. <laughs> but, you know, the truth is, I mean, who here has ever not had enough money to do something that was super important to them? You can empathize with that, right? So it's like, I don't need to make you feel what it's like to be the king of all Londinia, and like your kingdom is crumbling. It's like, no, it's like, oh, God, this was my favorite shirt, <laughs> you know? And then, then you can get the empathy, and then you can get the heartbreak, and whoever had another kid be rude to them, and take your... <laughs> that sucks. You so so you know, and I will also say in addition to go small, avoid not just the cliche, but the gross cliche. Do not threaten a child. I'm and not just I'm talking to everybody here, and you guys too. <laughs> I will not abide bullshittery of this magnitude because it's the cheap way of trying to get me to emotionally engage. And if you put a child in jeopardy in the early pages of a book or movie or comic or anything, I think you are a shit storyteller. Because this is absolutely unfair, manipulative storytelling. And as a father, I will not cop to this level of manipulation. It's the same thing, and it's like, it's like, oh, I need the character develop this female character. What happened to her? We know. How do, you, how do you develop a female character, right? Well, she's been raped in the past. Bullshit. And if you do it, I will put down your book. I'll drive a nail through it, and I'll <laughs> bury it in a crossroads. And I'll throw it right through your window. Because <laughs> you're a chef storyteller. You should know better. <laughs> Sorry, I'm God, I have so much caffeine. <laughs> really intense there. I really apologize for that. I'm just going to be quiet now. <laughs> Go small. <laughs> so I'm going to rewind it. I'm going to rewind it. I'm just going to stick it there. I'm going to rewind it. I said, Go small. I'm sorry. I got nothing after that. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Bricks available outside. <laughs>